Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to you as we come to worship together. And uh, again, a welcome to Harry as he comes back to speak to us. The announcements this evening in Glen Hoy, there is the annual sing-along, that's at 7.30, with refreshments afterwards. Midweek is back again this week, and that's over in Glen Hoy at 8 o'clock, or via Zoom if you're unable to join in person. Then the Youth Fellowship will meet on Friday the 29th, and that will be a trip to the Jungle Outdoor Pursuits at Money Moor. And the pickup will be from the church here at 9.30 in the morning, planning to be back around 6. Youth Club uh, doesn't meet again now until the 19th of April, and that will be up in the Bailey Hall. Then uh, crossing the line, it's a DVD launch and, uh, by Reverend Rodney Beacon, who is somewhere down in our uh, congregation today. Uh, and that's going to be in the Valley Hotel, Five Mile Town, on the 19th of March, Tuesday the 19th of March, and that's at 8 p.m. <laughs> and uh, it will bring the story of how the troubles impacted him, brush with death, and uh, you are most welcome, and I would encourage you to go to that. Then for PW folks, uh, Ochnacloy, Balamagran, give you an invitation. You can read that in detail on the sheet. Uh, there are daily bread uh, milklets out in the porch for you. And uh, then on the 6th of April, uh, the guide unit will be having, uh, in celebration of their 70 years of guiding here in Clonher, they will be having a colour run in Nutmany. Again, more details on your sheet there. Uh, various other announcements uh, for you to read uh, when you have a bit more time. But for now, those are the announcements, and uh, hand over to Harry. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's lovely to be, for Valerie and I, to be back here again. <clears throat> Our scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, and it's on page 1001 of the Pew Bible. That's page 1001. We're going to read words from Jesus which provide instruction, challenge, and assurance in a passage of Scripture entitled The Great Commission. Reading from Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. This is the word of God. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. And we know that the Lord will bless this reading of his holy word to our hearts. I think I better count those helmets. <laughs> It's like, no, I'm not going to tell you what happened in Enniskillen because it might happen here in a week or two or a month or two, if, you, if, I'm, if I'm allowed back. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father God, open our ears to hear your word. Soften our hearts to accept your word. Give us faith to believe all your word tells us and grant us the ability through the grace of the Holy Spirit to apply your word to our lives. For we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> I'm sure, like me, you've noticed that today, the 17th of March, is a day of celebration for many. Across the globe, public buildings are lit up green. From Sydney, Australia, to New, to New York in the United States, and many places in between. Many pints of the black stuff that's Guinness to you and me will be drunk. People who have never been to Ireland in their lives 
will be toasting their Irishness. However, it is unfortunate that the memory of Patrick, celebrated as the patron saint of this island, but more importantly regarded as the missionary who brought the gospel to Ireland, has been totally hijacked by sentimentality, nationalist politics, and businesses looking for yet another lucrative money spinner. Because here's the thing, Bible-believing Christians, Presbyterians like you and I, have much to learn from Patrick's story of devotion to his Lord. So this afternoon, let me take you on a journey to discover the real Patrick, a man of conviction, a man of compassion, and a man of courage, a man who, though he died over 1,500 years ago, has much to teach us about our own relationship with God. My wife, Valerie, and I volunteered for five years for a small local missionary organization some of you might be familiar with, called somewhat quaintly the Irish Evangelistic Band, IEB, or simply the band for short. This gospel spreading ministry began in 1936. Its aim was simple. Its members were devoted to taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Northwest and West of Ireland. In recent years, that is pre-COVID, its biggest missionary effort in terms of numbers of volunteers and people introduced to the Lord Jesus occurred around two dates in the year. Both were centered on Patrick. On the 17th of March, when people across this island and further afield celebrate the fact that he's patron saint. And on the last weekend in July in Westport and its surrounding area in County Mayo, on what is no, known locally as the Reek Weekend, a mountain named Croke Patrick is visited by many thousands of pilgrims who are determined to walk in Patrick's footsteps as they climb its rugged terrain. Just to give you an idea of what it's like, every single um, mountaineering um, rescue team in Ireland went to Crow Patrick. I'm talking about pre-COVID. Sometimes there were 20 or 25,000 people walking on this mountain. It's about the height of Slee Donard, and it's extremely stony and rugged and dangerous in places. But many thousands of pilgrims, despite all the dangers, walk up that slope and walk down that slope. Because tradition has it that Patrick spent 40 days on that mountain praying and fasting as he sought the will of his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Yes, indeed, his Lord and Saviour. News to the many thousands of honor honorary Irish men and women and those native-born who today are celebrating not as deep Christian belief because to many of them they're unknown and irrelevant. This, more, this afternoon I'm going to introduce you to three ordinary people, people just like us, who over the course of one weekend in County Mayo experienced the Holy Spirit intervening in their lives. In each of their stories, we will explore those three key aspects of Patrick's life I mentioned earlier. Conviction, compassion, and courage. And my prayer is that you too will be touched by the Holy Spirit. If you're uncertain about the whole Jesus thing, then I pray your skepticism will be challenged. For others, including myself, I pray that our compassion your compassion for the lost will be deepened. And our zeal, our enthusiasm for the Lord's work, your zeal and enthusiasm for the Lord's work will be strengthened. But before we go any further, we need to explore our attitude to that word, saint. As members of the Reformed faith, it's maybe not a term that's used in many of our church services. But saint is a biblical term first used in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. It was then used extensively in the New Testament, particularly by Paul, whenever he was writing to churches in the ancient world. For instance, in the book of Romans, he writes, 
to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his saints. And then in Philippians, Paul writes, to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi. Saint or saints are therefore universal terms originally used in the Bible to describe God's servants and in the New Testament to describe followers of Jesus. It is therefore a term that many of us here in church this afternoon or people who listen at, are listening at home can be addressed by because Paul calls all who are born again by that wonderful title, saint. Over the years, various church traditions amended that pure biblical meaning to build up the reputations of certain individuals and set them on man-made pedestals. This is seen at its worst when human beings, people just like us, are elevated to sainthood and then become worshipped themselves. We would do well to remember that in the eyes of God there are only two types of people, those who know the Lord Jesus as Saviour and those who don't. Before we travel to Mayo to meet our three friends, let's find some more out about Patrick. Patrick was born in around 372 AD with many reliable sources indicating he was brought up in modern-day Dunbartonshire on the northern bank of the River Clyde in Scotland. His family could be described as Romano-Britain. The Romans, contrary to what many people believe, did in fact settle north of Hadrian's Wall, that big wall that was built between what we know as England and Scotland. The Romans went beyond that wall, and by the 4th century they had brought their way of life and Christianity to parts of southern, western and central Scotland. Patrick was raised on a farm by a family who were devoutly Christian, and he received a measure of education. Then when Patrick was 16, disaster struck. He was captured by raiders from Ireland and brought back to Ireland by them as a slave. After six years of living in what Patrick describes as squalor, he escaped his captors and eventually made his way home. As an adult, Patrick gave, grew in his Christian faith and he began a career in the church. And it is believed he returned to Ireland around 432 AD. He died in 461 AD, having devoted the bulk of his long life to the Lord's work. Two of Patrick's writings have survived. His Confessio, which is Latin for confession, and his letter to the soldiers of Caroticus. The larger work, Confessio, contains biographical details, identifies his spiritual beliefs, and gives accounts of his ministry, especially here on the island of Ireland. Only eight manuscripts of this precious document still exist. It has been described by scholars as a testimony of personal faith and trust in God, and as a humble acknowledgement of God's grace in Patrick's life. Throughout his writing, Patrick presents as a Christian of great honesty, humility, and he had a great knowledge of Scripture. And you will, I'm sure, be pleased to learn that in his writings, there's no mention of snakes or Guinness or leprechauns. Now let me introduce you to the three people we met in Mayo. We'll call them the skeptic, the pilgrim, and the new convert. As I said earlier, the last weekend in July was a significant time of outreach for the Irish Evangelistic Band. On the Saturday morning, a group met at the Good News for You Christian Bookshop, a venture run by Calvary Missions, located at the Octagon, basically the town square in the middle of Westport. After a time of fellowship and prayer, we set out a range of Christian literature, including lots of stuff for children, on a table on the pavement outside the shop. And over the course of a few hours, many folk came over to browse, take away what they wanted, and on occasions, good conversations occurred. We also distributed many hundreds of specially produced St. Patrick booklets like these, both by personal contact and door-to-door -door distribution throughout the town. You can see that they've been produced by a guy called Dick Q, who comes from Tipperary, uh, 
and they're, they're designed even in their color and the, the, the outline of, of what people think may, Patrick may have looked like, although I don't know. But that's, that's to attract people that maybe aren't like us and are used to the gospel. Um, but there's a complete gospel message in these booklets. They're absolutely fantastic. During one face-to-face -face encounter, I met a person we will refer to as the skeptic. I noticed a woman standing by the barriers at a set of traffic lights, and I wandered over. We got talking, and it became very clear that she was upset. She told me she'd been raised in England, but she was back in Mayo visiting relatives, having recently experienced a bereavement. Our conversation turned to faith. And she said in no uncertain terms that because of her treatment at school by the nuns, she had no time for religion. This dear woman, now in her 50s, was like so many others, scarred by damaging personal experiences. She regarded Christianity and the church in a very negative light. Her skepticism and disapproval, though sad, were understandable. Her conviction what the dictionary describes as her settled opinion based on her hurtful, even cruel behavior she'd, she'd suffered from people she identified as Christian meant that she wanted nothing to do with God or religion. As we talked, the woman listened with increasing interest as she heard about a savior she had never been introduced to. She learned that Christianity wasn't about religion, but about having a personal relationship with a God who cares and loves for each one of us. Her skepticism was diminishing as she heard the truth about Jesus. As we promised, as we parted, she promised to read the gospel booklet, one like this that I offered her, saying that she'd be given much to think about. It's ironic that we stood talking in the shadow of what is known as St. Patrick's Monument, which towers above the octagon. Around it are, graved, are engraved excerpts from Patrick's confession. Five words start his confession. I am Patrick, a sinner. These five words sum up Patrick's conviction or firm belief that he was someone who needed a savior, a rescuer to pluck him from the darkness of a life separated by sin from a perfect God. This great revelation was imparted to Patrick when enslaved and far from home, he began to reflect on his young life. As he pondered over all that had happened and remembered all he had been taught as a child, the Holy Spirit began to soften his heart and he recognized his need of salvation. Many years later, he wrote, I did not know the true God, but at that time I lay in death and unbelief. I had no thought for my salvation. Maybe someone here today in this very church is experiencing a similar encounter with God, the pull of the world challenging an invitation from the Savior to trust in him, to leave the past behind and to give your life to Jesus. My prayer is that you respond as Patrick did, for he wrote, the Lord opened the sense of my unbelief that I might at last remember my sins and be converted with all my heart to the Lord my God. Patrick regarded this profound personal transformation to be an inner experience. He wrote, I saw him, that is the Lord, praying inside me, or so it seemed. So I believe because of the indwelling Holy Spirit, which has worked in me ever since that day. Patrick's conviction that God in his mercy gave him the precious gift of a new life in Christ was so great it led him to devote his life to Christian service. He took to heart the great commission that we heard in our scripture reading, convinced that Jesus had set him free not only from slavery but also from sin. Patrick spent the latter part of his, of his Christian ministry here in Ireland bringing the gospel to the people of this island. Now let's leave the busy streets of Westport, move forward to Sunday and make our way several miles along the coast to Croke Patrick, 
or as Roman Catholics call it, Ireland's holy mountain. By Sunday, the band has been joined by others, and we number about 30, but there are plenty of jobs to be done. So we take turns praying, preparing and serving juice, which you need gallons of for all those thousands of people that are coming down the mountain. Litter picking, which doesn't sound very glamorous, but which provided great opportunities to witness. But perhaps most, of, most important of all, staffing our gazebo with its refreshments and literature stalls. It is here that many conversations with folk who are finishing their climb took place. And this is where we will meet our next character, one we will call the Pilgrim. A guy in his 40s approached the gazebo, situated near the foot of the mountain. He looked absolutely shattered, and I offered him a cold drink. We got talking, and he then had a cup of tea. I was immediately aware of his sincerity, and I got a real sense of someone who had a deep faith. In his West of Ireland accent, he told me he was a teacher. This was not his first trip to Croke Patrick. Oh no, he was a regular pilgrim, climbing this mountain at least four times each year and faithfully carrying out all the rituals prescribed by the church. So he walked round the cross at the bottom of the mountain seven times. He prayed with his rosary breeds frequently as he walked up and down the mountain. And if there was a priest at the top of the mountain, he took communion. He wasn't, however, like some of the pilgrims that we saw with bleeding feet who walked up and down hundreds, maybe thousands of metres in their bare feet. Absolutely crazy. Well, that's what I thought. They did it for a reason. They did it because the church told them they should do it. No matter what we might think about such rituals and the whole concept of pilgrimage, there was no doubt, however, about the pilgrim's devotion. Something else became apparent. This man's genuine concern for the state of the world and especially the people that he taught and lived among. His way of dealing with these heartfelt concerns was to carry out the rituals he'd been introduced to as a child. We talked about another way, a way of faith in the one who at the cross defeated sin, Satan and death. Though he believed in God, he failed to grasp the fact that, when, that Jesus, by his death and resurrection, enables all who believe in him to have new life, which comes through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. That power Patrick wrote about so graphically. This picture of Jesus, not still nailed to the cross, but alive and active in bringing many people to salvation right across our world, presented this dear man with the hope that he was searching for. Patrick knew this hope in a real and life-changing way. It was the source of his compassion, his deep concern for the pain and suffering of others, and his heartfelt desire to reach the lost for Christ. This compassion turned into action, was fueled by the sense of debt that Patrick felt he owed to the God who had saved him, shown him such grace and mercy. Finally, let me introduce you to our third character, a young man we will call the new convert. For this is exactly how he was introduced to Valerie and I. It wasn't this is James or Jane or John. This is the new con convert. The new con we, I mean, we, we, we later learned this job. We didn't sort of call him the new convert all day. I'm not going to tell you his name. The new convert, as his title suggests, had recently come to faith. He'd been saved, as this is sometimes termed. In the flush of enthusiasm this ma massive life change so often brings, he agreed to come with a friend from his church to that reek weekend. But he was totally unprepared for what he'd signed up for. So much so that when Valerie and I suggested we go for a well-earned coffee, he somewhat sheepishly admitted, I've brought no euros with me. Luckily, Valerie's got a big purse. However, what the new convert lacked in practicalities, he made up for in enthusiasm, and he spent Saturday walking the streets of, new, of Westport doing the Lord's work, throwing himself into everything with pure joy. 
Valerie and I still smile when we remember our young friend. But as well as enthusiasm and joy, the new convert possessed another characteristic it is important for a Christian to possess. That characteristic we talked about with the children, courage or bravery. To step out in faith, to be different from the crowd, to move out of one's comfort zone, maybe to be the only Christian, the only believer in your family or your place of study or employment or your friendship group requires courage. If this describes your situation this afternoon, then I hope this story about the new convert who approached strangers offering them the precious word of God demonstrates that God gives courage to whoever calls for it. If you're in need of courage today to face tomorrow or to face going home, then ask for it now. Patrick also demonstrated great courage. Put yourself for a moment in his shoes. Ireland for him was a place of slavery, full of bad memories and where he had experienced much hardship. But while there he learnt the native language, customs, and he also learnt of the population's spiritual darkness. Unbeknown to, God, to him, God was preparing Patrick for his greatest challenge, that of bringing the gospel to a people steeped in paganism and idolatry. In his confession, Patrick recounts that in a dream, he heard what he called the cry of the Irish, who pleaded, we beg you, holy youth, to come and walk among us again. He wrote, this touched my heart deeply. And so in middle age, Patrick returned to the land of his former cap captivity. Given all he had suffered, this decision in itself required courage. But in addition, while ministering all over this, this island, he was sorely tested, experiencing insults, threats, ridicule, robbery, and imprisonment. Even his fellow clergy in Britain wondered, why does he put himself in danger among hostile people who do not know God? For Patrick, the answer was simple. He truly believed he was fulfilling Christ's great commission, and he acknowledged the courage to do this comes solely from God. Patrick ends his confession by declaring his love for the people of Ireland and God's gospel promises. Then he writes, I pray for those who believe in and have reverence for God. That's us. I pray for those who believe in and have reverence for God. What a fitting way to end this study of Patrick, a believer whose conviction compassion and courage are to be admired, emulated and given thanks for, rather than a figurehead to be toasted, prayed to or idolised. Amen. And now let us come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, on this day of celebration for many, we give you thanks for the witness of Patrick your servant who brought the gospel to Ireland. We pray that as, as, that as we have learnt of his conviction, compassion and courage, we too will be encouraged to play a greater role in the Great Commission, to bring gospel hope to those who are currently lost to Christ. For all of us can pray. Some of us are in a position to support mission financially, and a number may receive a call to go in person to take the good news of Jesus to places both close to home and further afield. So Holy Spirit, speak into the hearts of all present at this service today and help each one of us to become more like Patrick with a deep conviction of our need for a saviour, full of compassion for those who remain outside the kingdom of God and possessing the courage to step outside our comfort zone as we strive to serve and follow Jesus. And all this we pray in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. Just before I introduce our closing prayers, you may have noticed that in our opening prayers, especially in our prayer of confession, I use some rather old-fashioned phrases. For example, terms such as Almighty and Most Merciful Father, and there is at times no health or goodness in us. 
These are extracts, extracts from Puritan prayers, a people who lived many hundreds of years ago, but who believed in sound doctrine, personal piety, and social renewal. Their approach to prayer and worship and life is especially humble and honest and rich in expression. And I think there is much we can learn, certainly that I can learn, from their example. And now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.